Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and open them to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to be in Daniel 6, and actually we're going to make our way through the entire chapter. But uh, obviously my hair is this color because we really believe in camp, and that was part of our incentive process to register kids for camp and for students to go to camp. And so um, this is a really important season. Summer is kind of the time where kids really become the central kind of focus, even though they are throughout the year, but this is kind of like they are the focus of what's going on in our church right now. And so, as Pastor Lawrence talked about with Discover Project and camps and things, so uh, camp is a really important uh, catalyst in the life of a student and a child. Um, almost every young person that I've known that has followed Jesus through their life and growing up in the church will point back to a camp experience. Something that God did or said that is outside of their normal context that was catalytic in their understanding of who Jesus is and shaping their life. And that's why we believe that God shows up. We believe that God shows up here, too. But obviously, we know that when you get outside, just like that's why we do retreats, too. When you get outside what's comfortable and what's easy and what's familiar, a lot of times all the things get stripped away, and then you're left with you and Jesus. And that's when some really good stuff can happen. So, But we've been in a series through the summer called Influencers, and we've been talking about the power of influence and influence being the power to persuade and asking the question, who are we allowing to influence our lives? So Pastor Nate spoke last week, did a great job talking about Joseph and what we all love to talk about, waiting, which we hate. But it's not the waiting that's the most important thing. It's how we actually wait. It's what God is doing in the middle of those moments when we wait and see what God is up to. So this week we're shifting and we're going to talk about Daniel. And we're going to go through a chapter that most of you, if you've been in church, maybe even haven't been in church, you've, you've heard of Daniel in the lion's den, right? And it's, it's a story that we become familiar with and it almost becomes kind of this legendary kind of folklore kind of story of a guy going into a, a den full of lions who are hungry and they don't eat him, they don't touch him, and this miracle happens. But the story underneath the story is what we're going to really focus on today, and that is doing the right thing. And when I use the phrase doing the right thing, sometimes it's like, okay, we're going to talk about the difference between right and wrong. Well, that's kind of the surface level when we talk about doing the right thing, because the real issue is not necessarily determining what's right and wrong, because ultimately that's what God's supposed to do for us if we allow him to, because he's a lot better at it than we are. But the issue of doing the right thing is an issue of trust. And that is, there is one kind of foundational question when you and I are faced with something we know is right to do and something we know is wrong to do. There is one thing that is underneath the surface that you and I are always grappling with, and that's this. Who am I going to trust? And there's really only two entities that you will choose to trust. Yourself or God. That's it. Because even if you choose to trust somebody else, in a sense, you're trusting your own intuition, your own wisdom, your own guidance, as opposed to trusting what God may want for you or what God may have for you. Why is this so important? This goes back to the beginning of time. This battle, this tension underneath the surface goes back to the Garden of Eden, to Adam and Eve, when they're confronted with this opportunity to make a choice of whether to do what God said to do, which was what, he said, literally, you can eat anything. You can have anything in the garden except there's one tree I don't want you to touch. And the reason is because God knew what would happen when they touched that tree because it would unravel their lives. And they were faced with the decision, will I trust what I see and what I can perceive and what I can understand or will I simply trust what God has said is right? And if you don't know the story, literally Eve looks at the tree along with Adam. Adam doesn't get out of this either, both of them. And it says that she looked at the fruit and saw that it was good. Which was Eve in her own mind saying, I'm going to make a choice to trust my own abilities, my own wisdom. And then the next decision she makes begins the unraveling of human history. Because all of us make that decision every single day. Will I trust God? and do the right thing, or will I trust myself and try to figure it out on my own? Now, every once in a while, you and I get it right, but most of the times, we don't. And that's why God said, let me do the heavy lifting. Let me help you to understand what is right, what is wrong, and help you to choose the right thing. So in the story we're going to look at today, let me give you some context, and then we'll pray, and we'll jump into it. So we're going to talk about Daniel. Daniel, the, in the book of Daniel, we get to this place where Israel, if you fast forward in their journey, come out of Egypt. Eventually, they get into the promised land that God's given them. They have this identity, but in the promised land, they forget God. It's kind of the story of humanity. When we finally get everything we want, we forget who gave it to us. It's God. And then because of that, they lose the very land that they had. They are now exiled. They are taken over by Babylon. So now they're in this foreign context where now they're not in control anymore. They're not in power. So they're in this culture that is 
polar opposite of who they are, polar opposite of the God that they serve. And so they're kind of, there's a lot of this upside down and just confusion. But in the middle of that, there are a handful of people who are being faithful to God, and Daniel's one of them who Daniel's choosing in the midst of a culture that tells him to go the other way, he's choosing to follow God, even though it may cost him everything. And we'll talk about that journey in Daniel's life today as we prepare to kind of receive what does God want us to hear today about what it means for us to do what's right and trust him in our lives. Would you pray with me as we prepare this morning? Jesus, we thank you that your spirit is at work in our hearts and minds right now. And Lord, we know that when we go to the words that you inspired in the Bible, that, Lord, there's always something that you are speaking to us, something that you have for us, something that you want us to see or understand that will change our perspective and change the way that we understand ourselves and you and the way we live our lives. So, Lord, would you open our ears, soften our hearts so that what you have to say today will penetrate deep into our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to cover a lot of ground today because we're going to cover the entire chapter 6 in Daniel. So we're going to kind of take a little at a time. But we're going to walk through, and there's six things, six things I want to highlight that, ta- that help us understand that what it really means to trust God. What is the, the things? And they come in the form of questions. So when we trust uh, God enough to actually do the right thing, these are the things we have to consider. The first one is this. Do I trust God with my position? With my position in a career, with my position in life, with my status, do I trust God with that or do I trust myself? So starting in in the first verse of chapter 6 in Daniel, we get into Daniel's story here. It says, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one. So Daniel's rising to the top in what he considered a pagan culture, opposite of what God would want. To whom these satraps should give account so that the king must suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. So I want to stop there. So what's happened is Daniel is choosing to follow God in a culture that is the opposite of what he's living. And because of that, they see there's something different about Daniel to the point where the king gets his, Daniel has now gotten the king's attention to the point where the the king's going to make him basically the prime minister over all of Babylon. This is a foreigner. This is not somebody who was born amongst their people. This is someone who's who's exiled and now is going to become one of the most powerful people. How in the world did Daniel get there? Because he positioned, and he worked really hard, and he achieved, and he made sure that he was in the right place at the right time so the king would see him. So, no, there's none of that. If you read through the story in the pre-story in this, you never see any of that. What did Daniel do? He just kept following God. He just kept choosing to do the right thing, and that's why he was distinguished above everybody else. Why is that significant? Because when you and I worry about our status in life, our position in a job, our position in life, our economics, all those kinds of things, we start to take into our hands the very thing that God wants to do for us. And we start maneuvering, and we start positioning, and we start orchestrating things so that we can get to where we want to be. But when we do that, we miss out on what God's going to do. And we will never get to where God wants us to be if we try to do it on our own. Nate talked about Joseph last week. Joseph never maneuvered himself, but God ended up, what, making him the most powerful man in the world at the time because God did that. We are presented with opportunities all the time where we can leverage or we can, we can manipulate or we can use a situation to get us ahead. The question is, will we trust God to get us where he wants us to go or will we take matters into our own hands to get us where we think we're supposed to be? So I was presented with this right out of college, literally hadn't even graduated yet. So coming into ministry, this is, there's, you know, ministry is a really interesting thing. Church is a business, and it also has to do with spiritual things. But the reality is that sometimes we make the mistake of going down the business side and don't really realize that we're missing out on what God wants to do. So I'm two weeks from graduating, and they used to have a thing called symposium at my college where all of basically the leaders within our denomination would show up, and they would basically do job interviews for students coming out of Life Pacific University. And so Kim and I sat down with different leaders to kind of find out what's happening in the regions of the country, what opportunities, so they could get to know us. And the first interview we sat down with, I couldn't believe it. So so of you who don't know me, my last name is Amstutz, and in our denomination, the name Amstutz has a very, very good reputation because of my dad. 
because of his history and missions and all kinds of things. And so we sat down with the first leaders, and we're sitting there, and so we introduce ourselves, and, and, and I said, this is, you know, my name is John, and this is my wife Kim, and I said the name Amstutz, and you should have seen the supervisor. His eyes got huge. And he just paused, and he kind of stared at us, and we're like, so what kind of things are going on in your district? And this is what he said. He didn't even tell me anything about what's going on in his district, how we could be a, you know, figure out what's the next step for us. This is all he said to me. He said, oh, Amstutz, you can use that name. He said, all you need to do is mention your last name and every door will open for you. And I remember I sat there and I thought, does he even know who I am? I mean, he hasn't even asked me any questions about what I want to do or what I feel called to do or where God may be leading us. He just heard my name and now he's saying, your name will get you anywhere you want it to get you. And you know what? Honestly, he was right. Because it, when I, and I'll be honest, I've never used my last name to leverage anything. In fact, I have fought against that. But I remember for a moment, I was like, I was offended and then I was intrigued. Like, ooh, I could. I could use my name. I could get doors open. And then, then I started to realize people would use my name to open doors for me. And then I would get in the door and try to explain to them, if you think you're hiring my dad, you're going to be sorely disappointed. He's way better than I am. He's a way better teacher. He's a miscue, all those kinds of things. But you may not have a, a last name that has a certain kind of status in the career that you're in, but you may be presented with something that will give you an advantage that you can utilize to promote yourself to a position that you want to be in. But when you do that, you miss out on what God wants. So here how, here's how I know that's true. When we walked away from that meeting, Kim and I talked about it, and I said, we're, and she agreed. She goes, we're never going to leverage our name in Foursquare to try to move somewhere. And so we took six months after I graduated and was working my job. Kim's working full-time in Azusa Pacific. And we're just saying, God, where are we going to go? And so we visited a number of churches. We're just open. We're praying. And out of the blue, I get a phone call from a man named Dennis Easter. Now, Dennis had history with Kim and I. He had actually married us. He was Kim's pastor for a period of time when she was growing up. And this is what he said to me. He said, the Lord woke me up out of a dream about you last night. And he told me that I was supposed to call you today and have a conversation about you becoming our youth pastor. I had not talked to Dennis since we had gotten married. I had not talked to him about ministry. I had not, I had not leveraged. I had not done anything. And out of the blue, he calls. And that opens the door for what opened the door for our future and what God wanted to do in our lives. But it came through a dream, independent of anything that I had done or said, because that was God at work. Do you think that maybe God knows your life better than you do? Knows how to position you? I'm convinced Daniel knew that he didn't have to do anything but simply follow God, and God would put him where he wanted to be. Do you trust God with your position? Second thing. Second thing is, do you trust God with your enemies? So when we trust God enough to do the right thing, we have to be willing to trust him with our enemies. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's go on in the story. So Daniel's doing the right thing, but we get to verse 5. Daniel 6, it says, Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. They knew he was a righteous guy. They knew he was doing the right thing. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition or praise to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O can the king establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So Daniel's doing his thing, being, doing what God wants to do, doing the right thing, and what's now is happening is there's jealousy involved because now he's getting what the others wanted. So they obviously are devising a plan. You know what's interesting in Daniel's story, if you read through the entire story, not just in chapter 6, nowhere will you ever find Daniel defending himself. In fact, the same thing was true with Joseph last week. You will never find Joseph defending himself. In fact, when you follow people throughout the scriptures, when they choose to follow Jesus, they never defend themselves. They even never defend God. They just trust him. I've realized in my life, God doesn't need you to defend him. He's much better at it than you are. 
He's God. You and I aren't. Why is this significant? Because ultimately, what's the, the difficulty for us is that when we have enemies, we think that we're supposed to retaliate, take revenge, stop this these things that are unfair and unright and, and make sure that our enemies know and make sure that we, everybody knows that there's something going on behind the scenes and, and defend ourselves. But Daniel never defends himself. He just simply focuses on God and does what he's supposed to do. Why is this important? Ask this question of yourself. Do I spend my time defending, fighting, or worrying about those who may be against me or do I focus on God and trust him to take care of me and my enemies? How much of your life is spent focusing on your enemies? on what they're doing or not doing, what they're doing to you. Sometimes we can be consumed by that. But here's the good news. You and I have the ultimate example of how to handle our enemies. It's Jesus. When in, in the Bible, if you've read through, especially the first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where in any passage in those, in that, those books do you ever find Jesus even defending himself? He gets accused, he gets mocked, he gets falsely put on trial and convicted and sent to the cross. Everything is against him, yet he's perfect, and yet not one time does he defend himself. Even to the point where he's on the cross, and they're mocking him, and they're making fun of him, and then his only response to them is he prays to God while he's dying, prays to the Father and says, Father, forgive them. He's saying, to forgive who? His enemies. He's saying, God, would you show them love and forgiveness even though they don't fully understand what they're doing? Why is this significant? Because where is God's revenge? Here's the good news. God's revenge is the resurrection. That's the revenge. Why? Because you can take my life, but you can't touch my soul. That's what Jesus said, I will die, but I will rise again. And as a follower of Jesus, we identify with that. And because Jesus' forgiveness in our lives frees us from sin as he was free from sin, then death for us is never the end. Revenge is the resurrection, which means you may take my life, but you can't touch my eternity. And your enemies in this life may take your life, but they can't touch your soul. And Daniel knew that. Daniel understood that even if I die, I still win. Because I so said, I don't defend myself. That's why Paul wrote this in, for, in 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then he goes on and says this. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Who's good at revenge? God. Can you trust God with that? Or do you have to do it in this life? See, this is something that's so hard for us for, because we, we live in a country where we take our rights seriously and because of that, we think that we have a right to defend everything about us. But as a Christian, you've surrendered your rights to Jesus. Leads to the third thing. Trusting God enough to do the right thing also means asking this question, do I trust God when the rules change? This is the hardest point for me in this whole message, so I'm preaching to myself here, Okay. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God, his God, as he had done previously. So what is Daniel doing? The same thing he's always done. The rules changed, but that doesn't mean that doing the right thing has changed. So what's Daniel doing? The same thing he's always done. He's going to go and he's going to pray. Just because the rules change doesn't mean that Daniel's going to change. Think about this. Do I change my commitment in following God when circumstances change or when persecution is present? How do I react when the rules change? So I'm doing something that I've always done and suddenly now the very thing that I thought I could do, now I'm not supposed to do anymore. How do I respond? Do I stop doing it? Or do I keep on doing it? But there's a motive here. This is what I want to get at, because this is what's really power, powerful about Daniel, and especially when he doesn't defend himself. Daniel does what he's always done because he values what he's done. He doesn't do what he's always done out of protest because now it's illegal. This is really important. Daniel just didn't change his routine. He was always going to go pray, and he's always going to pray three times a day because that's what he did. So he kept doing it. Why? Because he wasn't doing it because the rules changed and he was going to protest. He was doing it because he had a connection with God that that's the way he had lived his life. 
And as followers of Jesus, in this day and age, we have to be careful that we don't assert our right to do a certain activity because it's right before God as a protest to the culture that says it's wrong. Because when we do, we've just made the battle about us. We have. And this is, this is important because the answer to our faith being pushed back on is never protest. It isn't. At least from the way I read the Bible, it doesn't show up. It's interesting. Back in 1962, mandated school prayer was removed and it was determined to be unconstitutional. And now, of course, I wasn't around in 1962, but I have heard over the years how I've heard so many people in our country say, yeah, you know when the wheels came off the United States of America is when they took prayer out of schools. Did you know that prayer has never been taken out of schools? That was mandated prayer in a classroom where a teacher could pray and require students to pray. That was the only form of prayer. But you know, it's always been in schools as long as I've been alive and all of you have been alive. You can pray. And the people that always prayed in school, guess what? When it was ruled unconstitutional, they just kept praying. It just wasn't from the front of the class. It just wasn't prominent. They kept praying. Why? Because there's a difference between protest and lawsuits and obedience and being trust, trusting in Jesus. I know lots of people who go to public schools, who teach in public schools, and they pray all the time. And they're not worried about if it's illegal or legal to do it because they're not going to go protest if it somehow is outlawed. Daniel was not praying out of protest. Daniel was praying because he was connected to God. And that means the motivation to do what is right is never to say, I'm doing this as a statement against what you say is not right. I know, I'm, I know some of you are probably stepping on toes. I'm not meaning to step on toes. But this is the call of the church in our world today. Read from the history where we've come from. God's people did not protest and God broke through. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everybody hear those strange names? They also were in Babylon. And they were not supposed to what? They were only supposed to bow down to the God of Babylon. And they refused to do that. Why? Because they didn't do that. But they didn't do it out of protest. They did it out of allegiance to God. And where did it end up for them? In a furnace that was supposed to burn them alive. And who shows up in the furnace? Most likely it's Jesus. Walks into the furnace spares their lives. Why? Because they were always doing the same thing that they've always done, staying loyal to Jesus. Daniel staying loyal to Jesus, even though the rules have changed. Moving on. Aren't you glad we're moving on? I'm harsh on that one because, man, that's me. That is me. So, number four, trusting God enough also means to do the right things means that do I trust God when things become unfair? So this is probably 1A for me. This is another hard one. Daniel 6, 11 through 15. says, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before God. And they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man or within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, who heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, O oh, no, uh, now, O king, that this is the law of the Medes and Persians, no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. This is the guy that, that the king is going to make prime minister. This is Daniel, who's going to oversee the whole kingdom. And now he realizes that he has put out an injunction that now is going to condemn Daniel to death. The leaders have tricked him. Do I trust God when things are unfair and just when life is not how is my life spent? Am I seeking justice for myself or am I simply just seeking God? This is a tough one. Man, when we are done wrong, it is hard to not react, to not say it's unfair, to not push back, to not be angry. I get all that. But there's something inside of us that when we are at peace with God, we can endure what is unfair in this life. I learned this lesson from a guy I coach basketball with. It's another dad. 
when uh, Jordan, I think we, we, Jordan reached fifth grade, I think is where it was. We, 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 he had played basketball for a few years and a couple group of uh, players in the league had gotten good enough that we put together a travel team. And so Jordan got to be on the travel team and me and another dad got together and actually three dads got together and we pulled this team together and we had about 15 players. And so we, we had the first season, we weren't really successful, but the kids had a great time. We went and played different tournaments. And uh, one of the kids, uh, his grandfather used to be a high school coach. So he volunteered to come in and kind of give a next level coaching for fifth graders. It was great. It was, it was fun. We had a good season. That season ended and then next season started. And we kind of did uh, an open gym to kind of try out, get the guys back in the gym again and kind of do it again. And so uh, the, the grandfather of one of the players came in and he was kind of running the, the tryout out kind of like assess our kind of talent again see if we were bringing in some more guys and so we me and the other dads we were with them we were working and we thought this is going to be a great season the guys are improving and so we finished that and then the next thing you know a couple days later later uh, the grandfather has now formed a team and none of the sons of the dads who started the original team the year before are on that team He's come in and he's hived out all of what he thought is the best talent and he's created another team and kicked us all out. I was slightly upset. I remember driving in my car and, and the name of the father who had helped start another guy, his name is Kevin, and I called Kevin. I said, Kevin, did you hear what Denny did? He goes, yeah, I did. I said, this is wrong. He goes, yeah, it is. I said, it's unfair. He goes, yeah, it, it really is. I said, we can't, we, we can't let this happen. We, we got to do something. He goes, yeah, we, we, we probably should do something. I said, well, like I'm waiting for like Kevin, get mad with me. Come on, join me in my bitterness, right? And he's like, yeah, you know what I think we're going to do? We're going to form another team. I said, no, 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 wait, Kevin, this is wrong. Denny stole our team. In fact, he stole like the two talented players, the point guard, who's like this, the centerpiece of our team. He's, I said, Denny, we can't. I mean, I said, Kevin, we can't do this. And Kevin said, no, we can and he was calm, and he was at peace. And we formed another team with our sons and some of the other players, and I watched Kevin the entire season, no exaggeration, never said a negative word about Denny. There was even times where we ended up in the same tournament as that team. Man, I have to ask for forgiveness because I wanted them to get killed. <laughs> and there was some sweet justice when Denny got kicked out of the tournament. It was really great. Anyway, so that's a side note. That's a whole nother message. That's my own issues, right? <laughs> but what I learned from Kevin is that Kevin was so at peace that he didn't feel like he didn't have to defend himself, he didn't have to defend his son, didn't have to, this is unfair. He, he simply said, you know what, we're just gonna go a different direction. And what was really interesting about that is that team kind of, kind of reduced itself into a really bitter group of people. That we were actually relieved after the second season that we weren't really part of them anymore because they weren't really representing our city anymore very well. They weren't representing the kind of team that we would want. And it was kind of nice that they had hived themselves off and they could go do their thing and we could actually develop the boys that we wanted the way that we wanted to develop them. But man, I remember just, it's so unfair. But I learned from Kevin that at the end of the day, that if I don't defend myself and I allow God to, to deal with the unfairness in my life, that ultimately God will do what God's going to do. But if I get sidetracked with something being unfair, I will miss what God's up to in my life. Two more things. The fifth thing is trusting God enough to do the right thing means also asking this question, do I trust ultimately God with my life? Do I trust God with everything? So here we go. Daniel 6, verses 16 to 23. Here's where it really, the rubber meets the road for Daniel. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast in the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. Then at daybreak, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions and he came near to the den where Daniel was and he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king uh, was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had what? Trusted in his God. <laughs> 
Now, if you're like me, I have either heard or read this story so many times, and sometimes there's a danger in that. You become so familiar. Do you realize what this was? This was a guaranteed death sentence in the most horrific way. It wasn't lethal ejection. It wasn't firing squad. It wasn't even an electric chair. It was being devoured alive by a group of lions. Nobody wants to go that way. And nowhere does Daniel fight it. Nowhere does Daniel push back. Daniel simply goes into the lion's den because here's, I can tell you this, and this is something I will confirm someday in heaven when I talk to Daniel. Daniel went into that den believing to live or die didn't matter because he had already trusted God with his life. And if God chose to say, you know what? Your life's gonna end at the, in the mouths of some lions. Daniel was ready for that. He had already surrendered his life. And when you've already died, you can easily give up your life because your life doesn't belong to you anymore. And if you trust God with your life, then ultimately he's the one <laughs> in charge. He's the one that numbers your days. He's the one that determines how long you live. He's the one that ultimately determines when you live and when you die. If you truly trust him, can you trust him that you've given up your life? See, I've, I've, there's something, I've, I've been around a handful of people in my life who, it's like, they got it. I struggle with it, but they got it. They literally have surrendered their life. And because of that, they just don't deal with fear like I deal with fear. They really, like one of those people that I, I'm convinced has gotten this, and most, many of you know him, Greg Barshaw, the head of Connect Two Ministries, who worked with Haiti. Greg already surrendered his life a long time ago. And so, like, I've told him, like, Greg, you need to take care of yourself. And he goes, oh, you know what? I do take care of him. But you know what? If God wants me to die, I'll die. And he says it like he really believes it. And that's why there's things that Greg will do that nobody else will do. Because Greg's, Greg has this confidence. Nobody can take my life but God. And therefore, I live my life openly that God can take it any moment. If we lived our lives that way, what, what would that look like? that we weren't so afraid that, you know, everything that I do is going to cost me my life. Let me just read from somebody who I've, I've read about and listened to a couple of, of his testimonies on video, but there's a guy named Joseph Stone who's a, a severely persecuted Romanian pastor a number of years ago before the fall of communism, and, and he was in Romania, and in Romania it was illegal to be a Christian, but he was a pastor and trying to lead people, and he, many times he was detained and tortured and all kinds of things. And one of those detaining, I've read this quote before, but it just so captures what I feel like what, what God wants for us, this kind of understanding. So he's being interrogated once again, and he says to his interrogator, he says, Sir, he says, let me explain how I see this issue. Your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Here's how it works. You know that my sermons on tape have spread all over the country. If you kill me, those sermons will be, uh, sermons will be sprinkled with my blood. Everyone will know I died for my preaching. And everyone who has a tape will pick it up and say, I'd better listen again to what this man preached because he really meant it. He sealed it with his own life. So, sir, my sermons will speak ten times louder than before. I will actually rejoice in this supreme victory if you kill me. Can you and I say that? Can you look at someone who has the power to take your life and say, go ahead? I don't know if I could. Let's be honest. But that's what God wants us to get to. To say, listen, you can take my life, but you're, you're, you're not going to touch my soul, my eternity, because my life belongs to Jesus. And ultimately, if he wants me to die at your hands, he'll let it happen. But if not, and by the way, just after this, <laughs> the interrogators pulled, pulled back and said, what in the world are we going to do with this guy? So they let him go. They listened to him. They realized he is more powerful in death than he is alive. We need to leave him alive. But how could Joseph Stone do that? Because he had already surrendered his life. So if he did die in that moment, he knew that it was God who was in control of everything, just like Daniel did. So, which leads to the final thing. And that is asking this question about trusting God. Do I trust God's means for God's purpose? So I'll explain about that in a minute, but just let me just read the last few verses, 24 to 28, Daniel 6. It says, And the king commanded... And those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives, 
And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the people, people's nations and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You and I can't write an ending like that. What's happened? The most powerful man in the world now just sent to his entire kingdom, which was most of the known world at the time, the real God is Daniel's God. Because what? Because Daniel trusted his God. And Daniel did the right thing. And because of that, God, through a pagan, this is crazy, a pagan king who is opposed to the Jews and to their, their God, is now the one who's sending out to the world who the real God is. How in the world do you get to that? You and I couldn't orchestrate that. But God did because it was God's means ultimately for God's purpose. It was God's roadmap that, to get to God's destination. Here's the tension for some of us. Is that I will trust God enough to point me to the destination, but I'll trust myself to get me there. This is the danger so many times of when God reveals something about our future or, or where he's leading us. We try to get there on our own. But when you'll discover one of the true things about following Jesus is the, the journey is as important, if not more important, than the destination. So when God gives you a direction, he's not saying, get yourself there. He's saying, I will lead you there. That's why when he brought Israel out of Egypt and said, I'm going to lead you into the promised land, he didn't just say, point the way and get there. I'll meet you there. He said, I'm going to guide you through this. Why? Because he had to do something in them to change and transform them in the journey. Now, this is the challenge. You and I are convinced that when we find a destination, we know the best way to get there. Anybody ever want to admit that's true of you? Every guy in the room, you can raise your hand. Some ladies, this is true of you too. Anybody, anybody ever argue, argued with Google Maps or Waze? Raise your hand. Right? When it takes you on a route, and you're like, nah, I know. That's not, that's not the fastest route. Or when it changes your route or it tells you to still go, even though you know when you're looking at that little line that's really deep, dark red, and you're like, no, that's really bad traffic. I should divert and go another way. And it's still saying the fastest course is this one. So about three, four months ago, I mean, not that, maybe two months ago, we were actually we were coming back from Fresno, many trips that we made up to Fresno this last year. Coming back from Fresno, and it was just after one of the huge rainstorms. And so if some of you might have been traveling the five. The five on the grapevine area shut down to one lane because some of the, the road was starting to give way because of a mudslide. And so we were coming down, and, and you know, I always, I always have maps on, and so I'm like, you know, and then boop, pops up, you know, road closure, blah, blah, blah. But it still says keep going the five. Now, I went into panic mode right away. I'm like, ah, I don't want to sit in traffic. So we're just north of Bakersfield. So automatically, I'm, I got my GPS in my mind. I'm already alternative routes. I'm thinking, okay, Bakersfield, there's the 58 out to Tehachapi. Tehachapi takes you out to the desert. You come down the 14, right? That's the first option. Like, and that's going to add probably an hour and a half. But man, how long is this shutdown going to take? And so then we pass Bakersfield and we're like, okay, we'll, we'll see. There's another option. There's the 138 when you go up to Bakersfield that still cuts out to Palmdale. So you can still catch the 14 and come down. Anybody know directions? You know where I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so I'm looking at, in fact, Kim's looking, probably Kim's laughing at me. I don't even know. But like, I'm stressing out. Because I'm convinced that I know better than Google Maps. And so we're getting to the 138. I'm like, oh, this is the turnoff. It's going to cost me at least a half hour if I make this half hour of life. Really big deal, right? And Kim's like, I think you should just trust the map. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. So we stayed on it. And sure enough, it wasn't as bad. Even though it was bad, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought. Nobody died. We were all okay. We all got home. It was fine. How many times do you sense God says, go this direction, and you're like, okay, I got it. And you fill in the blanks for God. And you tell him how you're going to get there. It's a fatal error that we all make. 
Daniel's heart was for God, and I convinced Daniel's desire was for everybody to know who God was, the God that he prayed to three times a day, the God that he served. But he trusted God to get God's name out and to orchestrate a scenario that only God could orchestrate to get to the point where the, a pagan God is telling all his people the real God is Daniel's God. Now, what if Daniel said, yeah, you know what? The ultimate goal is to get to get God's name out there, so I'm going to devise a plan, a great strategy, and I'm going to make it happen. Do you think this would have been the outcome? I can guarantee it wouldn't have been because it was God's means for God's purpose. And that's what's important for our lives. We are great at strategy. And sometimes in the church, this is our downfall. I'm, I'm guilty of this. It's like, okay, God said what? Go make disciples of all nations. All right, let's have a plan, right? Let's have a strategy. Let's get a chart together. Let's spend lots of money. Let's have all, right? And sometimes God uses plans, but usually it's because we stumble onto his plan, not because he, he says, oh, your plan's better than my plan. But how many times in our life do we just need to simply say, okay, God, I don't get it. I'm gonna trust you that you're gonna get me from point A to point B. I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna take one step at a time. But in the meanwhile, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do what Daniel did. I'm gonna do the right thing. And what is the right thing? Trusting God. That is the right thing. Daniel only did one thing right. He trusted God. That was it, the simplest thing. And if you and I can get to a place where, listen, every single day I can ask the question, God, am I trusting myself or am I trusting you? Because I'm convinced as I continue to read, I've been reading through the Old Testament a lot, I keep coming to these pivotal moments where somebody had to make the decision again, do I trust myself or do I trust God? And man, that's where we either go right or we go wrong. One little side note, and then we'll, we'll close. So uh, reading through, as it goes back a few weeks, we were talking about Moses, but perfect example. Moses is probably the pinnacle of leadership in all of the Bible. He is. If you read through the Bible, he's talked about that way. Even in human history, he's talked about that way. Even Jewish culture, he's talked about that way. But Moses never got to the destination that God had for his people. And it's really interesting, and you, you get into the story where for 40 years, man, Moses has been a rock star. He has done it right. He's been a good leader. He's led a really, really horrible group of people, to be honest. Rebellious and bitter and backbiting and just sinful, and he's been faithful. And finally, they get close to the promised land, and they're at a point again where God needs to provide water. So God gives instructions to Moses, which he had done before when they needed water. And he says to Moses, he says, there's a rock, I want you to speak to this rock and I will bring forth water. Now, if you, there's a story earlier where God had told Moses to do what? Strike the rock. And Moses struck the rock and water came out. But if you read the story, Moses has now reached the frustration point. He's frustrated because he's like, man, we've been here before, you complained before. And so he basically turns to the people standing next to the rock and says, you stiff-necked people, so frustrated. He's basically saying, God's going to do it for you again. And out of his frustration, he doesn't do what God told him to do. He doesn't speak. Out of frustration, he takes his rod and he strikes the rock. And what does God do? God brings water forth. But in the next sentence, God says, Moses, now you will not enter to the land. Why? Because G Moses demonstrated something that he had not demonstrated up to that point. He chose to trust himself because he was frustrated with the people instead of trusting God. So I share that to say, how much of our life is spent reacting to us, to situations, to enemies, instead of responding to what God is saying? That's a decision we make every single day. Will you react or will you respond to what God has said? Daniel kept responding. But here's the good news. Even though pro Moses did not get into the promised land, Moses still spends eternity with God. We'll get to see him someday. But that's true for us, too, that even though we make those decisions where we're like, yeah, you know, I chose to react against my enemies, against my circumstances, instead of respond to what God's doing, God brings in forgiveness. We just sang it earlier. What God's mercy triumphs over judgment. Would you close your eyes? Let me pray as we conclude. Jesus, we thank you that you've given us influencers throughout the Bible that show us, Lord, although they're human like us, they're not perfect, in these moments, we get to see a glimpse of what you desire for us, what it fully means to be human. And that, Lord, we were never meant to determine ultimately the right and wrong that are presented to us, but, Lord, to trust you
that you will always point us in the right direction. And in trusting you, we can choose to do the right thing over and over and over and over again. But Lord, I also, as we conclude in prayer, I ask where we have all had those moments where we have done the wrong thing, where we've trusted our own wisdom, we've trusted the advice of culture or somebody else that has led us in the opposite direction of what you want. We are so grateful, Jesus. All those moments where we failed, you have covered through your death on the cross. You have paid for our wrong decisions and given us an opportunity to now once again do the right thing. So Jesus, this week, would you remind us in those moments where we have a decision to make, Lord, would you remind us of what the right thing is and that we would trust your wisdom, we would trust your guidance, we would trust your leadership in our life, not our own, and then again, over and over and over again, choose to do the right thing. We thank you, Jesus, for your work in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.